the 2021 um, is uh, is a critical uh, crucial, uh, critical year for the LDCs. Uh, we have completed the IPOA cycle and taking stock of our successes and failures, and we are now preparing to take up yet another bold and ambitious program of action for the LDCs in the um, as we prepare for the LDC Five conference in Doha in January 2022. Uh, uh, distinguish. Uh, uh, guests, uh, the IPOA, IPOA as, you, as you are aware, had an ambitious target to graduate half of the LDCs by 2020. Although the target remains unmet, significant progress has been achieved towards that end. Four countries have already graduated. At this moment, 16 LDCs are in various phases of graduation. And despite unprecedented challenges, uh, Vanuatu took a bold decision to graduate from LDC category in December 2020. Uh, in the last triennial review of the CDP, Bangladesh, Lao PDR, and Nepal were recommended to graduate from the LDC uh, category. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, however, has greatly jeopardized this commendable progress towards LDC graduation. Many countries on graduation track are now passing through second or third phase wave of the COVID-19 surge, that economic lifelines, including light manufacturing, tourism, ready-made garments, migration remittances, oil exports, et cetera, are bearing a heavy brunt. These sectors are facing enormous challenges in a highly uncertain and volatile global market. And as such, graduating LDCs remain uh, under growing threats to sl uh, slide back. And the cases of graduation deferral uh, by Angola and deferral requests by Tuvalu and Kiribati are, are stark examples of the difficulties that the uh, graduating countries are facing now. The CDP report uh, on the impacts of COVID-19 on LDCs manifest uh, alarming trends of rising poverty and inequality, market disruptions, growing unemployment employment decline of export earnings and remittances. Under these circumstances, the graduating countries have growing concerns about the prospects of graduation. They're concerned that graduation may doubly jeopardize the development journey, both by the COVID-19 consequences and the loss of LDC-specific support measures. Over and above this, there are other, also other concerns regarding access to financing for the 2030 agenda and climate actions and loss of benefits of technology transfer. To overcome this situation, we need bold and innovative solutions. It is imperative to develop comprehensive support measures to incentivize graduating countries in a sustainable manner. We have some important developments towards the end in 2020. The UNGA resolution on Vanuatu's graduation, for example, invited the development and trading partners to extend five years of ISMs to Vanuatu in its post-graduation period. The ECOSOC resolution on the impacts of the COVID-19 on uh, the graduating LDCs and QCPR resolutions have also come up with some positive recommendations. The LDC group uh, has submitted some concrete proposals for extended support for graduated countries to WTO in Geneva. Yet uh, the measures taken so far are far from adequate. There is a strong case in point for an, for an incentives-based graduation pathway for LDCs that would include time-bound support measures in post-graduation phase. We wish to engage with the international community, the development community, um, in conclusive discussions uh, to create such appropriate incentives and support measures designed for graduated LDCs. The LDC 5 conference provides us with an enormous opportunity to demonstrate international solidarity and partnership to advance this agenda. Against this backdrop, we wish to focus on the following questions, and we have leading experts and also practitioners from the national level. We would like to know what are the key issues regarding improved concrete support to graduating and graduated countries, including strengthening UN system coordination, especially now to build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic. And how to enhance uh, CDP's proposed contributions on improved support measures, particularly the, through the sustainable graduation support facility and an improved monitoring mechanism. And I'm very happy that we have two leading CDP experts with us today to share their thoughts on them. Uh, so uh, 
Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, distinguished colleagues, before we move to our panel of experts and real discussions, I would like to give the floor to Director of OHR LLS, LLS uh, Ms. Hedy Schroderes Fox. Um, she's also the chair of the Interagency Task Force on LDC Grad. Support and Heidi will make a presentation on strengthen and coordinated UN support as well as an overview of the launch of the survey on sustainable graduation support facility. Those are very tongue twisting, long sentences and long uh, names for um, for our uh, uh, for the different processes. But thank you. With those first few introductory remarks, I, I'm sure all of us are keen to listen to the experts, the real experts who are here with us. So without further ado, I would like, now like to hand over the floor to Ms. Fox. Uh, Hedy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Fatima and uh, Honorable Minister, Excellencies. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here this morning, um, afternoon, evening, wherever you are joining. We're very, very happy you're with us and uh, uh, on this important event that is taking place in the sidelines of the first session of the TREPCOM uh, of the fifth UN conference. The different uh, thematic panel discussions are tackling uh, important priorities for the group of LDCs, highlighting the continued need to strengthen the international cooperation framework if these 46 vulnerable countries all stand a chance to make real progress towards the SDGs during this um, new decade. So it has been 50 years since the creation of the LDC category. And uh, as the ambassador has just mentioned, only a few countries have so far graduated. Many others are now, um, will be graduating from the category in the next few years. However, a large number of countries, in particular countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, will continue to remain in the category unless bold actions are taken urgently to provide the specific support needed by LDCs to propel their development trajectory towards graduation. And at this juncture, it is important to review and reassess the adequacy and the effectiveness of the international support measures that are currently um, on offer to LDCs by the international community, uh, including the United Nations, of course. International support measures will only make a meaningful contribution to LDCs if they are designed to address the socioeconomic structure, productive capacity, and development challenges of these countries. And of course, these support measures must be specific to the needs of, uh, needs of each individual country. The LDC-5 conference provides a timely opportunity to introduce new and improved support measures that target the needs of LDCs at different stages of development, including graduating LDCs, in particular in the areas of trade, intellectual property rights, and financing for development. Graduation will be a key focus of the new program of action, and it will take center stage of global attention at the fifth uh, UN conference on LDCs in Doha in January. Whether graduating countries can sustain progress achieved throughout and after the COVID-19 uh, related health and socioeconomic crisis is a very pertinent question. We must face the hard reality. COVID-19 pandemic further emphasizes how structurally vulnerable even the graduating LDCs remain and how difficult it is uh, it can be for many of them leaving the category that has provided them with some exclusive measure of support. So today I'm thrilled to have the opportunity together with Ambassador Fatima and our uh, DESA colleagues and two senior experts from the CDP to dedicate focused attention on a goal that we've been pursuing with increasing intensity for a few years now, that of improving support to the least developed countries that are uh, on the graduation track, as well as uh, to recently graduated countries. Concrete measures to address the concerns um, uh, of the possible uh, disruption in the development trajectory trajectory of LDCs, including challenges and uncertainties in achieving 2030 agenda due to graduation are critical and they, they require urgent attention. And with this goal in mind, the Interagency Task Force on Graduation 
that I have the pleasure of chairing has been providing better coordinated uh, UN system support to graduating LDCs. And we have worked collaboratively um, with many UN agencies and relevant financial institutions, other international institutions, to really shine the light on the particular needs of graduating LDCs. We need a well-coordinated UN system support to these countries to lessen the burden on government capacities and support the work of resident coordinators and country teams as a true one UN. And relevant regional organizations need to be well linked into this work as well. Under the umbrella of the Interagency Task Force, a new um, important initiative is taking shape after a successful pilot phase. My office, OHR LLS, together with DESA as Secretariat of CDP, have made joint efforts to bring together, enhance, and integrate existing and new graduation uh, related advisory services to help graduating countries to prepare for sustainable graduation and graduated countries transition smoothly towards sustainable development. The Sustainable Graduation Support Facility that will be introduced in more uh, detail by Mr. Despacho, a uh, member of the CDP uh, in just a few minutes, is one of such efforts and a concrete measure designed to respond directly to the needs of graduating and graduated countries based on country demand by providing tailored capacity building and analytical assistance towards the formulation of smooth transition strategies. A second proposed concrete measure of support will be presented by Dr. Bhattacharya, also a member of CDP, keeping track of the development progress of graduating and graduated countries um, is gaining more and more importance as crises and emergencies occur uh, unexpectedly. The pandemic of the COVID-19, disruption of the global economy, natural disasters and climate change all of these can threaten the smooth transition path of graduating and graduated countries. And in this context, and as we look at the new program of action uh, for the LDCs, the Doha program of action, an enhanced monitoring mechanism needs to be put in place so that early warning, uh, warnings are triggered when crises hit the countries and actual support to respond to the crisis can be provided in a timely manner. So with this short introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to listening to the two CDP members elaborate on these important new concrete ideas and proposals, and really to hearing from you for your comments and your suggestions. So with this, I would like to give back the floor to Ambassador Fatima and remain here to listen carefully. And I am sure it will be a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hedi, for your very comprehensive overview. And thank you again for the important work that you're doing in leading interagency coordination on graduation. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished uh, delegates, I now, in, uh, uh, I now have the pleasure to invite um, the distinguished uh, CDP member, Mr. Tafere Tesfachu, to make his presentation. Mr. Tesfachu is a senior advisor at the Tony Blair Institute for... Well, I've just lost my screen. He's a senior advisor at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. He has over 30 years of experience in national and international development issues and has published extensively on a range of trade and development uh, topics. He is no stranger to the LDC uh, and graduation community, and we greatly appreciate his support and work. And uh, so without further ado, I would like to now hand over the floor to Mr. Tesfachu. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I'm sorry, I just seem to have lost my the screen went. We can hear you, but yeah. um... <laughs> no, no, I lost my my notes somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Excuse me. Ah. Oh. No. Excuse me, but uh, I have to, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Ambassador, thank you, Heidi. Uh, excuse me for this uh, delay. Um, 
Excellent, the Ambassador Fatima, distinguished guests and, and colleagues. My uh, intervention today, as Heidi indicated, uh, will focus on the graduation support facility, uh, GSF for short. The proposal by uh, uh, CDP, DESA, in collaboration with OHRLS. Uh, as you know, uh, graduation from LDC category was uh, very slow in the first four decades of the category's uh, existence. In contrast, the trend has been more encouraging since Istanbul. Uh, there are now 16 countries, as the ambassador was indicating, that are either in the process of graduating or have met the criteria for graduation for the first time. Now, this, this is obviously good news and it calls for celebration. However, as the number of countries meeting the criteria for graduation increase, new challenges have emerged uh, that require urgent attention and uh, action. Um, I'm talking, of course, about the lack of clarity on the preparatory process for graduation and the smooth transition arrangement after graduation. It has become increasingly clear that um, not all graduating countries are fully aware of the implications of departure from LDC category and what they need to do to ensure sustainable development after graduation. Uh, often they turn to UN agencies for continued support as they prepare to become a, a non-LDC developing countries. Um, in this respect, uh, in my view, the initiative taken by OHRLS in 2017 to establish an inter-agency task force for coordinating the support that UN agencies provide to graduating and graduated countries was commendable and timely. It was effective in reducing the confusion that was emerging with different UN agencies trying to assist graduating countries by offering diverse, but sometimes duplicative assistant without synergy and focus. As a former UN staff member and someone who participated with OHRLS in the earlier efforts to coordinate support by UN agencies, I can testify from personal experience that the coordination and guidance provided through interagency coordination by OHRLS was extremely helpful, both for the participating agencies and the graduating countries. However, as the number of countries meeting the criteria for graduation increased, so has their needs and the requests for graduation related capacity building, technical support and policy advisory services. The heterogeneity of the graduating countries and the diversity of the challenges they face has made it essential to improve on the mechanism for supporting graduated and graduated, graduating countries by building on the pioneering uh, coordination work undertaken to date through the interagency task force. To this end, the CDP in consultation with OHRLS has proposed the creation of this sustainable graduation support facility to complement the work of the interagency task force by coordinating the provision of wide range, a wide range of technical and advisory support services to graduating and graduated countries. For the rest of the, uh, my presentation, I will in brief highlight the primary goals of the proposed uh, graduation support facility, the type of services that the facility intends to provide, and the key players in this endeavor. The primary objective of the GSF is to assist countries with the preparations for graduation and also the formulation and implementation of a smooth transition strategy after graduation. The services provided by GSF will be demand-driven. And in fact, the whole scheme is designed as a country-led process to provide a range of ser services tailored specifically at graduating and graduated countries. For effective delivery of support services, the GSF will identify partner institutions that have the necessary expertise, proven record in technical service provision, and of course, the resources needed to provide effective support. In terms of the institutional and governance structures, the intention is to utilize the competencies and services of existing institutions rather than create one. For governance structure, the CDP is proposing the establishment of a steering committee consisting of experts with a technical knowledge to guide the work of GSF. In this respect, the role of interagency task force would be critical. 
is in, in providing the coordination required for maximum impact. The question is what type of support does the GSAF offer? Now, uh, as you can see from the, I hope the slide is uh, showing at least six distinct service offerings identified. Um, these are not random choice, uh, but based on the experiences of graduating and graduated countries. However, soon after the introduction of the facility in this side event, the CDP plans to conduct a survey among the potential beneficiary countries and other LDCs to establish whether the services provided meet the needs and concerns of graduating and graduated countries. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through the rational and operational details of the services offered. In fact, many of them are self-explanatory. Suffice it to say, however, the services accessible through the GSAF cover critical areas ranging from supporting countries with the extension of existing international support measures to uh, accessing non-LDC specific support measures, assisting with the preparation and the implementation of smooth transition strategy, identifying ways in which countries can access finance for development, which is critical, facilitating South-South cooperation and enabling countries to participate in CDP's monitoring process. The CTP Secretariat is currently piloting five of the six service offerings in a recently graduated country, Vanuatu. We hope that the lessons learned from Vanuatu's experience will help improve the system provided by GSF. In terms of eligibility, the GSF will, uh, of course, focus mainly on graduating and graduated countries. However, as more experience is gained, support will also be given to countries at an early stage of the graduation process so that they can start their preparations as early as, pos uh, as, early as possible. Finally, uh, to achieve all this, um, feedback from member states on the GSF and the proposal to establish a steering committee will be essential. Equally important is the mobilization of adequate resources to finance the coordination and implementation of support provided through GSF mechanism. As you know, coordination in delivery of services is essential, but it has costs. Therefore, the support of development partners to this timely and indispensable initiative will be critical. In the course of this year, these two essential elements, along with the concerted efforts to make the role of the GSF widely known and accepted by the beneficiary countries will need to be given greater attention. Um, I try to cram as many information as possible to use the time allocated to me. I hope that's fine. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tespachu, for your excellent presentation. And I don't think we have been very fair to you by giving you that very short time. And uh, certainly this deserves the whole session by itself uh, to go through that. So we hope we'll have that in future. But uh, as a consolation, we'll make sure that you know presentation, your presentation is shared with, with all, all the participants here. Thank you very much. And thank you for reminding us about the new challenges that have emerged for graduating. The lack of clarity, I think that's something that we faced many times when we were dealing with our um, uh, the, the different national um, uh, actors um, uh, in my country about the graduation process itself. And I think this whole, the challenges of, have, of course, compounded now amid the pandemic. And um, that is why, you know, it's so, so very important to ensure that we have a very smooth process. I think that's very, very important. Um, and the right support services. Thank you very much. And uh, we shall certainly continue our discussion, Mr. Tespachu. And you are Thank here, you. of course, and uh, in the uh, later section of the meeting, we will Thank have you, an Thank you. We'll have an opportunity for further, you know, um, further discussion. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to call upon uh, Dr. Debo Priyo Bhattacharya. Uh, he act needs no introduction to this group. He's a highly regarded and leading macroeconomist and public policy analyst and a distinguished fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue a think tank in Bangladesh, as well as a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. He's a former ambassador and permanent representative of Bangladesh to WTO, UN office and other international organizations in Geneva and Vienna. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure that he could join us today. Sir, without further ado, I would like to call upon you to make your presentation. You have the floor, sir.
Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Um, let me first say, as a Bangladeshi, how proud and privileged I feel to speak under your guidance and chairpersonship today, Madam Ambassador. It's, uh, and I would like to also thank my colleagues at OHRLS, Heidi and her team, and also my colleagues at the CDP, Roland and the Secretariat members, and all the other uh, eminent people who have joined in today for this discussion. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about one particular issue which has been relatively under discussed, understated in the graduation process of the LDCs. It, re it refers to the surveillance of the graduated LDCs in particular and graduating LDCs as well. And, and what type of reaction or what type of policy responses that we need to have to support this smooth transition of the graduating LDCs. If you see that uh, the, the monitoring process till now of the graduating LDCs have been focused more on the pre-graduation process, the post-graduation process monitoring has did not really attract much attention or traction. So if you look at those countries which are graduated, they were supposed to be monitored first three years uh, um, at the first yes, annual call. and then to uh, two uh, tri uh, triennial reviews. And then, uh, uh, and, and so a total number of seven to nine years, they were supposed to be under observation, the graduated LDCs. And if you look at the, the number of reports which should have been submitted to, as a follow-up of that, is that 33 country years uh, had been there, but only seven reports were available. So it is a clear case that the current monitoring mechanism conducted once in a year in the, the CDP plenary prior to that, and also the, uh, the post-graduated uh, mechanism was not generating adequate input thereafter. And although the CDP monitoring activity is man mandated by ECOSOC and the GA resolution, this particular part was relatively uh, under-discussed, underdeveloped, and under-attended to. So the CDP thought that given that the new number of the huge number of graduating LDCs now in the pipeline, 16 or 18, depending upon every other day, the number may increase. And so it is on the both on the supply side and on the demand side, both have increased. The supply side and more numbers uh, have in graduating and also in the demand side, given the complexity which the ambassador and Haiti uh, have mentioned that within the complex environment within which they are graduating. So here the CDP along with OHLLS comes forward with a proposal which may be considered as one of the deliverables for the LDC-5. So what is this program? And to start with, to divide, designing this pro, uh, pro, uh, proposal, what we looked at at the experience and so tried to find out why the countries were not reporting. So there, the first and foremost was that the, even if there were crises, there was no immediate response built into the mechanism. So even if there is a crisis, what do you do with it? Within the mechanism was not very much understood. And then even if you had a, 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 the if you extend the preparatory period or the graduation transition period, it was not necessarily linked to your crisis or to monitoring mechanism as such. So the process and the outcomes were not related. And third, not last but not the least, there was no incentive for the reporting because there was no guarantee that even if you report that it will ensure that some support will be coming through from the member states in this case. So all these three cases, the process issue, the outcome issue and, and the incentive part, we need to address in the future. To keep keeping this in view, we come forward with a mechanism, a proposal, how to strengthen the what we call the enhanced mechanism for monitoring of the graduated LDCs in particular. So if you look at the monitoring cycle, if it was, a, I put, we put a, a comparative chart even here, what was before and what we are proposing. So you will see that the once a year uh, over there, and now it will be continuous. It won't be dependent upon whenever the plenary takes place and only then we do it. We will be continuously monitoring. We should be monitoring the process. The, as you know, the CDP has appointed now country monitor, uh, say a country rapporteur with, from the CDP members who will be also looking at the process continuously in that. There will be annual monitoring report and you need to look at how the scope of this annual monitoring report has been 
broadened, both scaled up and scoped up. So they, there were macroeconomic indicators because if you, uh, LDC criteria do not capture, as you all know, many important macroeconomic indicators. So we bring a more comprehensive list of macroeconomic indicators along with the LDC indicators. What is also important that the productive capacity issue has been brought in because without the productive capacity, the sustainable graduation cannot be th thought of. And then what is important, and this is where I will draw your attention, the country commitment to transition will be also checked out. It is not only about the supply side, it is again the demand side. The countries have to show, demonstrate that they're uh, they, they are also committed to transition. They have a smooth transition strategy, a sophisticated one, contextually relevant one built over there, which can be used by the development partners too. So the reporting is mechanism will be very important. And last but not the least in this table, you will see, we are also talking about the virtual meeting with the government. Earlier, it was only pra during the plenary uh, of the CDP, if at all, if there was a case, big, a case issue, in his, but here, the PRs in New York will be definitely be in taking part in the discussion as the situation evolves. Then if you look at the next uh, slide, please. And so the, if that is the diagnostic part, what is the response part? So we, we try to look at the diagnostic part and then the response part. The response part is that regular communication challenge with the CDP, uh, this mechanism. And most importantly, each country would need to design now trigger indicators, uh, which means that what are the crisis telltale signs, the early warning system, which will entail some, which will demand some kind of a global response or regional response uh, from the development partners over here. So one of the mechanism for that is that, of course, the crisis impact assessment immediately if the crisis situation unfolds. The development, uh, the development partners will be convened um, in the country, in country by the UN uh, resident coordinator and will recommend measures to the ECOSOC and thereafter. So, to, uh, so that it can be pulled up from local to global. And then we are also suggesting <coughs> that the development corporate D DCF forum, development cooperation forum should have dedicated session on specific country or on specific thematic or, the, or uh, crisis uh, situation over there. Last but not the least, again, capacity development related to monitoring will be tremendously important. This will be important both for the CDP, it will be doubly important possibly for the countries itself. So, and, and on all other related uh, uh, agencies over there. So here I put to you, Two, two hypothetical cases, what may happen. One is not so hypothetical anymore, Angola. The other is Bangladesh. And when I put up Bangladesh, it will be, I will be putting it with a tongue in the cheek and it doesn't have any concrete implication um, because it is more a disaster case scenario, which I do not want for my country, definitely. So look at the Angolan case. What happened in Angola is the oil price went down uh, and then the COVID came along and then the travel restrictions. So throughout 2020, all these were unfolding. So, and then they came in that the, the local the resident coordinator rapporteurs and other took actions, they took note of it. And by the month of June of last year, and then Angola comes out and makes a statement at the high level political forum that uh, the challenges it is facing, IMF brought in the bailout packages over there. And then the COVID issues ag exacerbates, um, aggravates further. And then in December, Angola requests ECOSOC to postpone its LDC graduation uh, date. And, uh, and that happened um, uh, finally, as you all know. So the, GN, uh, the, the General Assembly postponed the graduation of February, in February. So here you see that this is a crisis situation response by through then, even without the full monitoring unleashed over here. Uh, we hope that by the time in the next any other situation, God forbid, if it comes, then we will be much, should be much more ready with the surveillance mechanism. Let me show Bangladesh. And I, I, as I say, this is a hypothetical ca case. Uh, please, the next uh, slide, please. Uh, here, if in Angola's case, it was the oil exports, in Bangladesh case, it will be the garments exports. So say in 2026, uh, down the line, thankfully, uh, I don't know about you guys, I won't be around, so I, I won't be responsible for the circumstances. So month by month, for se se uh, sequentially for three or six months, the export revenue falls. So if there's ex export revenue falls, what happens? So 
CTP sends a, they does a full assessment of the crisis situation. It calls upon through the uh, to all the UNRC, ECOSOC, and GAH, and the Development Co Co Cooperation Forum starts discussing all these things. Should not take much time, one month only. And by June, a roundtable within two months, the roundtable is convened by the resident coordinator, and the interagency task force takes note of that, and it goes after that to the ECOSOC and then to the General Assembly. And then whatever the General Assembly and ECOSOC decides. Uh, uh, the collateral measures are taken by the interagency task force and the GA. If it, if Bangladesh decides to have a bit more transition time, then the GA gives that leeway. So what is what we are suggesting here that we need to have a, a stronger surveillance mechanism, given the number of countries now in the pipeline and given their unfinished structural transformation, given the pandemic which is going and a very unhospitable global environment within which these transitions are taking place. So what we need to see do in the future. I mentioned here the three things. So if we want to uh, make this thing happen, we need to give the, the, the policy uh, you know, end endorsement to this whole effort. So the CDP needs to implement this enhanced mechanism monitoring process. So from that point of view, the member state definitely has to come on board. The LDC group has to come on board in full support for this mechanism as a deliverables as the LDC-5. And in between, we develop the whole idea much more further and stronger and contextualize it properly. This, the, the, there are two parts of it in capacity development. One is to increase the capacity of the CDP itself uh, so that it can uh, respond to this new challenge, a new, uh, new task. So uh, to properly monitor. And so you will see the three types of gap analysis has to be done. One is the data gap. Another is the, you know, the support gap, uh, that what type of support will be necessary to meet the crisis. And then there is a the capacity gap. So what type of capacity will be necessary to make, make good use of these policies or support mechanisms, the data, the policies, and the capacity. The similar thing, if you see in case of member state, and this is, I, I, I urge, uh, urge upon all the ambassadors and the high officials who are present from the member state, that it will also demand a lot of work on the part of the graduated countries and the LDCs. So they will have to generate a very uh, a large number of high frequency data because the crisis unfolds. You cannot depend on annual data five years back. You will have to have daily, you know, monthly data, high frequency data has to be done. You will have to have a risk con a mapping uh, has to be done in, in these cases. R risk assessment criteria and triggers have to be developed. And we define the double support measures which will be necessary for a graduated countries to meet the specific crisis and advocate should be advocacy should be done around the, these the measures around the resilience building and crisis mitigating. Colleagues, I can tell you that it is usually said that if you really do not measure, then you are not counted. In these cases, if we do not do the measurement and the surveillance, we won't be able to improve our situation uh, suitably. So for transparency, for accountability, and for more global response, a enhanced mechanism for monitoring the graduated LDCs have become very, very important. Thank you for listening to me. I thank you, uh, sir, for your very rich presentation and recommendations. Indeed, uh, surveillance of graduated and graduated uh, graduating LDs does not uh, receive enough attention. I would say we, perhaps because there's a lack of capacity even to uh, monitor that uh, whole process. But uh, I fully agree with you that it's so critical to support, uh, uh, you know, monitoring. Uh, for to ensure smooth transition to graduation and perhaps now more than ever. Uh, thank you uh, for highlighting some uh, important recommendations in this regard. And uh, as a graduating country, I know, and I'm sure others who are here today will also uh, perhaps have similar experience. Sometimes we are pulled between national aspiration to graduate and apprehensions about losing special benefits. And that is why it's so, so, so very important to understand the process and uh, so that we can actually reach out and get the right support, especially at the national level. I think there sometimes there is a disconnect and mismatch between aspirations and reality and uh, what we are doing perhaps in Geneva.
uh, or New York end uh, in with regard to the processes at the international level and what's playing out at the national level. So thank you very much for, for actually articulating some of those challenges and the processes to us. Thank you, sir. And again, uh, I would not even uh, uh, wish to venture into the hypothetical scenario that you sort of shared with us. Like, I, I think Bangladesh. <laughs> I hope that never happens, God forbid. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again for your extremely uh, excellent presentation. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, delegates, excellencies, uh, we have a few minutes now to have an open discussion with the two experts who have given brilliant uh, uh, presentations. So I would like to open the floor. If you uh, wish to take the floor, you can raise your hand or by using uh, or by using the chat function. Margarita, we are going to have uh, this open discussion with the two experts now before we move on to the national presentation. Yes. So if anyone wishes to take the floor, and now is the time to do so. No? All right, sir. Uh, I would then I would then request our two experts, our distinguished experts, to if they can remain with us. Perhaps after we listen to the national experience, uh, we can have a fuller discussion at the end uh, of all the presentation. Of Thank course, you again. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, excellencies, we'll now move on to the next segment of our side event. Uh, we will hear from distinguished lead discussants uh, uh, about their country experiences and perspectives on LDC graduation, as well as on different aspects of improved graduation support. And uh, uh, I mean, we have a very rich sort of panel of uh, discussants now, and I will request uh, all our honorable discussants to perhaps keep within the time limits so that there's enough time at the end uh, for a good interact interactive discussion. And uh, I have the honor uh, to invite our first lead discussant, um, uh, His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Aslam, uh, Minister of National Planning, Housing and Infrastructure of the Maldives. Minister, thank you for joining us at this late hour. You have been with us from the very beginning of this meeting. We really appreciate that. And we would now, now like to hear from you about the graduation experience of the Maldives and its pros graduation challenges. I think those are very invaluable uh, reflections that we'll all like to hear from you. Honorable Minister, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Fatima. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, by no means I'm, a, I'm, I'm an expert uh, in the subject, but uh, I've seen, uh, uh, we've learned few lessons in the process of graduating. Yes, you're right that we, uh, the graduation for us was supposed to happen in uh, December 2004, but the tsunami uh, put things, uh, put, put a setback to the things, and uh, we eventually got graduated. Uh, um, in, in uh, January 2011. Um, we are, I mean, the countries that are getting graduated are not of the same nature. Some of us are small populations uh, with limited resources whose economies depend on uh, few economic sectors. Others have multiple uh, uh, economic sectors with a large population. Uh, you know, so the nature of the countries do vary a lot, uh, certainly. All these definitely falls into the small island uh, developing state, and we have our unique challenges. Um, the time at which graduation happened to us was also a time uh, when we were uh, undergoing a huge political transformation in the country. Uh, often, uh, LDC countries. Uh, don't have advanced uh, governing systems and not the most democratic uh, uh, process of doing of doing things. Uh, governments are not the, are not the most democratic governments. Uh, so we were going through a, a transitional period where our first free and fair multi-party elections happened. A new constitution was brought in. A new elect uh, president was elected. The country was uh, heavily polarized, and uh, unfortunately, the government that was elected at the time did not get enough seats in the parliament, just barely enough to survive as, as a government. 
so there were a lot of challenges for, for the government then to bring in a new policy measures that were required um, to be in the graduated category. Uh, obviously, a lot of things did stop, uh, you know, things that uh, when we were at LDC, you know, certain funds that we took for granted. I mean, if I talk to, if I look at this from a layman's point of view, this is like uh, going from an, um, uh, from a teenager to an adult where you have a lot of responsibilities of your own. You are no longer uh, spoon fed and you're, you know, you are really becoming, you know, uh, something, you know, independent of your own. So it's something to be, uh, to be celebrated by any country, definitely. So we, we, we also celebrated that. Um, during that transition and also, you know, countries like us and, and many other, you know, we also have weak institutions. Um, institutions were not ready uh, for, for, for the graduation. I don't not think the country actually realizes, uh, you know, that that transition, what, what it would mean to them. Uh, we no longer have, uh, um, well, at least the the opportunities for concessional finance and sustainable finance become uh, a lot more challenging for us when you know when when the system is not ready for it. Uh, we so it, it um, so that 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 is the biggest challenge. The, the country with its institutions and with its form of governance was not really ready for things. Obviously, the people expect uh, um, development to continue as before, uh, but with you know, uh, you know much an effort from the country's government itself and and doing things you know on their own, uh, it becomes a challenge for us. Uh, this, I believe, open uh, the it gives an opportunity for. Uh, for countries who wants to make a spray uh, on, you know, getting certain things done, uh, uh, to take that opportunity. So we do become prey for certain countries who choose to do so uh, uh, with, 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 with finances that we believe that are important for us to continue with our, our development agenda, uh, both infrastructure and human resource development and institutional. Uh, um, infrastructure that uh, for, for, for funding when we are not ready and when we don't know how to go and access uh, sustainable concessional finance, uh, we find an easy path, you know, and then sometimes those whom we choose are not the best, you know, uh, or people or paths that we should have chosen, and then we could be easily enslaved. Uh, by you know countries who would wish to do so, and this is this, a lot of these things are happening uh, even in in Maldives. Uh, we, we start becoming very dependent on you know a few countries or a country you know that brings in even bigger challenges. Uh, we run into debt. Uh, so uh, in, in a nutshell, I I I, I would say for the graduation must happen. And it must be something we should be proud of to happen. Uh, and but the country's graduate should be uh, uh, both uh, politically, institutionally prepared to do that. I know there is a transitional period uh, for that to happen, uh, but uh, of, often that transition uh, is is not enough. I don't know what goes wrong, whether the time is not enough or what the things that are supposed to happen during that time does not happen or not. Uh, and then currently, I mean, the entire global community is undergoing this nightmare. And then I, I believe, you know, this is a special uh, circumstances uh, for, for countries who are about to be graduated. Uh, things cannot happen the, the, as business as usual. Uh, these are very challenging times. Uh, we here yeah, even in Maldives, we are going through, you know, our, our third wave, you know, in our second lockdown. 
uh, people, you know, are suffering at the same time, you know, in in uh, in an open democracy, you know, uh, and, and, and in a democratic system, people expect governments to continue to do things as they used to do. Uh, I mean, whether there is a pandemic or not, uh, realities. Uh, who, who will we, you know, the politicians will have to face the realities. There will be elections uh, when their time is up, and they will be judged by what they have been able to do or not do. So, you know, politicians try to do things in however way they can uh, to win the election, and that however way is not necessarily the best way of doing things. So, ultimately, the country suffers, you know, in the in the long run, uh, and people don't understand, uh, uh, you know, is it. The, the way people think in, in the developed world and in the developing world is, is very different. I mean, uh, so I, I, I believe challenges are immense um, and, and current situation we are in, it has to be a special circumstances. So uh, the, the countries are in pipeline to be graduated, uh, should be prepared uh, for this. And uh, you know they should be helped, uh, you know, to to make this transition smooth. If it, if for for many countries, I'm sure it, it's not a uh, smoothest of the transition. Uh, but we are there. We are here now. So I mean, we will say this ourselves now. Uh, that there will be bumpy rides, but but you know we 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 will go ahead. We will move forward. So uh, it's something that we should be proud of. But it's a difficult one. It's not. It's a challenging one. Uh, you know, but we must do. Everybody will eventually get graduated. Yeah, so we should all be ready for it. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is um, the, the very positive message or not, but uh, that's the that's the reality of it. And uh, thank you very much for you know uh, asking me, inviting me to be part of this discussion. And I think this is very useful, and uh, um, and and it should be it should help the the countries that are about to be, be graduated. Thanks so much. Thank you. I, I thank you, Honorable Minister, for sharing your country's experience. And thank you for being so candid. I think that's what we need to hear. Thank you very much. And you're so right. I mean, besides the institutional uh, preparations, I think political commitment is central, but as well as I think the buy-in of all stakeholders. Um, there are very, very important lessons there uh, in your experience for other graduating countries, especially from our region. So thank you, Minister, for sharing uh, your, your candid views and uh, for being with us here today. And I hope that you can stay on a little bit longer until we have the um, uh, interactive discussion. I think there could be questions to you also. Thank you, Minister, once again. I will, Fatma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, distinguished delegates, I would now like to invite Mr. Gregoire Nimtek, the Director General from the Prime Minister's Office of Vanuatu. And let me take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Mr. Nimtek, your government's bold decision to graduate from the LDC category last December, uh, despite the enormous challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we keenly look forward to hearing your views now. So Mr. Nimtek, the floor is all yours. Um, thank you, Excellency, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to invite Vanuatu um, to share the experiences. Um, it's very unfortunate that we can uh, we cannot meet in, uh, in uh, and see each other in person and uh, um, and discuss uh, and share the lessons of uh, our experiences for the past years uh, uh, with the LDC uh, graduations. Um, well, Vanuatu is not uh, listening. I'm listening to the Honorable Minister uh, from Maldives. Um, I think we, we would uh, more or less share the similar um, experiences. Uh, Vanuatu is, um, is a very unique um, in the sense that, you know, um, uh, if you look at the history where we're coming from, um, uh, we sort of like we, well. In fact, we are colonized by the two, we are con, uh, two condominium, um, French and British. And um, uh, when we had our independence in 1980, um, we have to take a very bold steps in uniting the two systems together in one. Um, and that takes a lot of uh, uh, efforts and uh, uh, commitments for us to um, to 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 unite the two systems, English and French uh, systems together as a nation. 
Um, and then, um, like like uh, from the previous experience, I mean, um, um, 1980 until 1991, uh, we, we we have experienced the stability in the government in the political uh, um, arena, um, and that's provide uh, a solid basis for us to to establish or to build the institutions, our institutions, our governance institutions, and also uh, be able to start, you know, building the the basis for our economy and even in terms of the social uh, services, education and health. Um, it's sad to say from 1991, we start experiencing the political instability. Um, and just three years after that, um, UN, UN have listed um, uh, Vanuatu for, for graduation in 1994. Uh, and that was a very difficult uh, decision for Vanuatu, um, uh, given the challenges that we face in terms of the leadership and political uh, instability that we have experienced. Um, and, and the fact that it's just like a decade from our, uh, um, from our independence, um, we find it very difficult uh, to swallow the concept, the, the concept of the graduations. Um, and that's, and that's the, um, that's the perception and the, that's the mindset of the people that, you know, and that since then we have looked at the graduations as, uh, uh, as something that is a threat to us. Um, and, that's the, uh, and that's the mentality that we have, we have uh, battled with um, our population. So since 1994 until uh, December 4, 2020, it's like it took us 26 years. Um, I remember when we graduated in, um, in December, I made an analogy um, that like, like, like a student, I mean, we all go to the university. Uh, and what do you do when, when, when your name was listed for graduations? Do you decide not to graduate or you will graduate? Um, so it, it, suddenly we have, we, have, we have to change the mindset of our population and citizens in order for them to accept the uh, to accept the graduation as a, as a positive thing, something that we should take on a positive note, something that we should celebrate. It's, it's a biggest achievement in, our, in, our, in the history of our development. So um, excellencies, I mean, it takes us a while uh, for, for our, our citizens um, to, accept the, to, accept the, to accept that we are ready to be graduated. Um, and if we look back uh, in the history, I mean, uh, of course, our colleagues from the UN, uh, UN DESA and um, UNSCAP and the UNDP, um, they are familiar with, uh, with the long journey that we took. Um, we have to defer for several times. Um, of course, we know Vanuatu is one of, of the very vulnerable countries. We are in the rim of, uh, of a fire. So almost like every year we face the, the natural calamities in them, uh, such as uh, cyclones, um, earthquakes, uh, floods. And, and just in, I mean, in 2015, we are hit by um, um, a category five cyclone, Tisipa. Um, and that's like, uh, to us as a small economy, um, it's, really, it's really something that, you know, um, <clears throat> it hits our economy very badly. And um, in 2019, um, or, or early, early to 20, uh, 2020, we, 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 we received another cyclone, um, this is Arol, uh, similar to the one we got in uh, 2015. Um, and, and on top of that, we, we also have COVID-19, which certainly, I mean, uh, as a consequence, we have to close all the borders. And that's really affect the small economies like Vanuatu, where we depend heavily on the agricultural uh, product and on most of the of our primary uh, products. Um, so it's it's a it's a very hard challenge for Vanuatu um, to go back to the table and accept the um, um, you know uh, proposal for graduating in December 2020. Uh, but we, we we have to thank the the efforts um, that we met in, 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 in providing in education and awareness of the people to the people and the citizens throughout um, a country that look, graduation is not a bad thing. Um, it's just, 
we should we should take it as a as a something that we should celebrate it uh, because because we we have we have been assessed by the united nations um on how we have been progress in our development uh, um, journey since 1980 until now and then we should it's something that we should be celebrating um so we have we have to uh work very hard to change the mindset of our citizens on how they look at things they couldn't accept um, the concept of the graduations because when they go back to the rural areas you know they always come back to us as, uh, as a senior bureaucrat and said look tell us you know how do you guys how how do you come up with a do you come up with a criteria or do you measure um and 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 said Vanuatu is ready for graduations because for us as a politicians when we go back to our constituency, we have we ha we ha we have not seen any sign of improvement at all. People are still living in the traditional ways of life, so it's a very hard battle for us, uh, civil servants, senior bureaucrats, to convince our politicians and said, "Look, um, we should be we should be celebrating because we have a United Nations body who assist us externally." And determine that we actually have made a progress in our development journey. So to us, it's a, it's a, it's a biggest achievement. So uh, to cut the story short, yes, we you know we have finally um, reached a point where everyone has to accept that yes, we are ready for graduations. And uh, despite the COVID nineteen um, and this is uh, the impact of the DC error. Um, category five that we we experienced in 2020. Um, I must say we have a very very uh, happiest celebrations when we graduated in December 2020. Um, that's just because of certain things. Uh, one, um, we we take comfort and assurance in our national sustainable development plan with a localized version of the SDC 2030. Um, we, uh, the, uh, how we went about to develop our national sustainable development plan, it took us three years and we have met a, lo a lot of consultations uh, to make sure that we captured the view of everyone. We are, we are not leaving anyone behind. Um, and that's provided a, 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 a solid platform for us to move forward. And our national smooth transition strategy is basically a short medium term of our national sustainable development plan. Um, so when, when we implement national sustainable, sorry, national, our national smooth strategy, we actually um, implementing the national sustainable development plan. So um, this gives, uh, gives a solid platform uh, for us to go back to the people. Look, we actually have a plan in place. Uh, we have a smooth transition strategy, which is a small short term uh, and uh, medium term strategy for us. And then we also have a long-term strategy, which is national, our national sustainable development plans. And that takes care of, of two things. One is the, our, our trade regime and taxation regimes. So uh, as, as we, 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 we start implementing the strategy, our focus now is more on, the, on how we improve our industries, turn it into a value adding, uh, so that we can prove we can improve our trade um, uh, balance and trade regime, and also a lot of focus were made to reform our taxation systems. So this is an area where we will probably um, solicit support from the um, UN, SNC, and other external partners um, to support us to make sure that we have a right um, uh, taxation regimes and trade regimes with will help us to coach the impact of the graduation um, from the LDCs. Um, uh, Excellency, having said that, having said that I, I want also to take this opportunity to acknowledge the greatest assistance and support that we get from our development partners like uh, Australia, New Zealand, EU, um, Japan, uh, China, just to name a few. Uh, and not, and most importantly, the support that we get from UNDESA uh, UNSCAP and UNDP and other UN agencies which where, where they help us to put together our smooth transition strategy 
uh, and also help us um, with, with, well, we, we hope that they will continue to help us to implement that smooth transition strategy um, as we go in forward. So to us, I mean, we, we acknowledge a tremendous and an excellence as support and assistance that provide by the UN agencies uh, and also external, our external and traditional partners will stay close to us to, to work together with us as we transition from the LDCs to a developing, uh, uh, developing status. So um, it, it's to us, it's provide a moral support. And that's what one of the good things um, that originally when we sell the concept of the graduations, it sounds like a big threat to us to develop a small economies. But in actual fact, the lesson Nimtik, we learned, um, Mr. Nimtik, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I would really request you to start wrapping up because we have still have five, six speakers um, so that, you know, we have time later on. We have about uh, 30 minutes. Yes, so if you yes, can kindly you. wrap up now, yes. Uh, thank you, Excellency, yes. Well, originally, I mean, the, the way we sell the concept of a graduation is like a big threat. Uh, but when, when we actually go into it, it it's indeed, as something that you know, uh, for those of uh, for those of our member countries that still need to be graduating, they should take it on a positive note and celebrate it. It's a big achievement in their development status as uh, as well as we have been experienced. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Nimtik. That was very very interesting, and I am sorry that I had to cut you short. Uh, uh, thank you again uh, for sharing your insights and experiences of your country's graduation process. Uh, very very important lessons there again for other graduating and graduated countries. And thank you also uh, for. Sh um, um, uh, uh, it was also good to hear about um, uh, the support that you said you received from the UN because our next speaker uh, is from the UN uh, family and uh, it'd be good to now hear the UN's perspective of how they support the graduation process in countries. So on that note, I would like to turn uh, to our next speaker. Uh, I would like to invite Ms. Sarah Sekines, the UN resident coordinator for Lao PDR to uh, make her presentation. She will share her experience in coordinating the UN support measures with the Laos, Lao government in its preparation for graduation. Ms. Sekines, you have the floor. Sorry, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all. My, my apologies on behalf of my resident coordinator who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but my name is, is Matthew Johnson Iden, and I'm the, the senior economist in her office, and I'd be very happy to make a few remarks on, on her behalf. So firstly, thank you to my respects to, to the, the chair, distinguished ambassador, distinguished participants, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to, to share a few reflections from the perspective of the UN Resident Coordinator's Office in Lao PDR as one of the countries that has been recommended for graduation by the CDP as of, of earlier this year. As has been emphasized by all of the speakers so far, the, the impact of COVID-19 is something that it's becoming ever clearer over the course of the year is going to be measured in years. And therefore the countries that have been recommended for graduation today, despite the extended preparatory periods that have been recommended are graduating into a more uncertain world. And for all of the reasons that have already been articulated in terms of the direct impact on, on health, but also the less direct impact on, on livelihoods, on trade flows, on investment and on government resources, to support national development priorities. It's become very clear through our conversations with government in the lead up to the CDP review earlier this year, that this is something that's weighing very heavily on their mind. And despite LDC graduation being something that's, that's been a national priority for, for decades and has been set out very clearly in successive national development plans, including the latest ninth National Socioeconomic Development Plan approved only in April by the National Assembly, there was clear concerns and a clear appreciation that the development momentum that's been built up over past years and has taken the country to the edge of graduation isn't something that should be taken for granted going forward. And therefore, there is a clear, crucial role for something along the lines of the enhanced monitoring mechanism, which was discussed earlier, and a commitment made by the international system to make sure that there is closer and more consistent monitoring of how things play out over the coming years and the commitment to making adjustments to the graduation process if things don't go as we would have hoped. However, even with the, the best monitoring system in the world, that alone will not be enough. And of course, there needs to be increased emphasis and 
And it's more important than ever to make sure that we do early on in the process start preparing clear, well-considered, smooth transition strategies. And, and that's something that we've started to work with the government on here in, in Lao PDR, because even in countries such as ours, where the direct, if you like, uh, measurable impacts of, of LDC graduation do look manageable, they do nevertheless still need to be managed. And many of the implications of graduation are, are quite technical specific things, which are, are, dare I say, unless you're an expert in this field, relatively arcane, and much of the expertise on LDC graduation for very sensible region reasons sits at global headquarters or at regional headquarters. LDC graduation being something that, that any given country should only hope to go through once. And therefore there are, are challenges in terms of countries being able to, to navigate their way to accessing that right expertise at the right time and making sure that decision makers in national governments are able to access the right types of advice. And that's something where I think under the new reformed UN development system, UN resident coordinators offices can play a potentially very useful role as an on the ground arm to help with the work of OHORLS and help with the work of the CDP Secretariat and UNDESA in terms of getting national decision makers access to the expertise that sits in these global headquarters and sits in regional headquarters, in, in our case, Bangkok, to advise them on the preparations towards that smooth transition strategy. And one particular instrument that I'd like to emphasize is the new generation of cooperation frameworks, which really set out the overarching framework for all of the UN's development support in a country. And we're, I hope, approaching the closing stages of developing our new cooperation framework with Lao PDR. And as part of that, we've been working very closely with colleagues in, in UNDESA and through the SDSF to design a clear joint output around support to transition and smooth, smooth transition beyond LDC graduation. Uh, and that's bringing together all of the key UN agencies which have expertise and have mandates relative to uh, LDC graduation and making sure that we have a clear plan from our side in terms of the types of support that we'll be able to provide in designing that plan initially and then working with the government to implement that plan over the course of the, the coming five years, but also being clear to the government in terms of what support they can expect from us on the journey towards LDC graduation to make sure that it plays out as the success story that we all hope it will do, rather than there, there being any bumps in the road, which, which could uh, lead, lead to progress perhaps slowing down or, or even, dare I say, in some areas going into reverse. One last point that I wanted to emphasize is with the increasing number of countries that are either being recommended for graduation or approaching the threshold of being recommended for graduation, that on the one hand does create challenges in terms of stretching the resources available from the system to really support those countries as they're going through that process. But it also creates an opportunity in terms of creating cohorts of countries that can work together and learn from each other as they're going through that process. And we've started uh, informally conversations with our counterparts in the resident coordinators offices in, in Bangladesh and Nepal as the two other countries in the region that have been recommended for graduation. And it's still early days, but it appears as if this is something that could be really useful for all three countries in terms of sharing lessons, working together and taking joint positions on the approaches towards LDC graduation over the coming months and years. I'm sure I've already run over my time, so I'll stop there, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for filling in for your RC. Um, um, we're also very happy to hear of the engagement between the UN city and the government. And uh, I've noticed that some other RCs and RCOs are also here with us today. And uh, I'm sure uh, they will also benefit from hearing your experience. Uh, thank you very much once again for joining us. I would now like to invite Ms. Elena I hope, uh, I, I'm not so sure if I uh, pronounced your name correctly. Uh, the Deputy Head of Unit of the EU Commission uh, in Trade, uh, DG Trade, uh, to share her experience. And uh, we are keenly look forward um, to hearing from her the perspectives of the European Union, a major development partner of the LDCs. Madam, you have the floor and my apologies again if I did not pronounce your name correctly. That's okay. Good morning for you all. I hope the sound is good for you. Um, 
Yes, I have been given four minutes. I will try to use them consciously. I wanted to mention three elements. The review that uh, we are currently doing of the EU GSP scheme and how this will impact in particular the LDCs. And this brings me to the second element, exactly the link between the review and the uh, increasing number of LDCs that will graduate out. And the third element is sustainability. So I'll quickly cover these uh, three elements and I hope you'll find them useful uh, for this discussion. But as a mean of introduction, you know that the EU GSP scheme um, really has at the core front a contribution to sustainable development. So access to the EU market and economic development should go hand in hand with promotion and respect of major international standards on human rights, labor rights, but also environmental issues. And the green agenda, how we call it, is becoming more and more a political priority in Europe. Currently, the EU scheme covers around 70 countries and more than half, the 48, all the LDCs are covered by the scheme. We offer duty-free, uh, quota-free access to the EU market with the exception of arms and ammunition, which brings overall access um, to 99% almost in terms of no tariffs. I will just give you some uh, names of countries which are the biggest beneficiary and you will not be surprised to hear that the, the biggest beneficiary in terms of value is Bangladesh. Bangladesh uses 25% of total GSP uh, import and then it's followed by India, to 23% and Indonesia 10%, uh, Vietnam and Pakistan. So these are the five biggest users. In terms of products as well, I'm sure I'm, it's not a surprise for you to hear that the biggest sector benefiting from uh, GSP uh, preferences is textile. Textile and clothing with 48%, followed by footwear 11%. So more than half of imports into the EU market using GSP preferences are apparel, clothing, footwear, and then we have some mechanical appliances, fish, leather, plastic. That is in terms of introduction. Also for the economics, I will my last point, the economics, we have seen, the statistics have shown that in the last years, the biggest beneficiary were the LDCs. Um, there's been an increase over the last five years of 47% of import only done by LDCs. 47% from 2014 to 2019 means that LDCs are really using these preferences. However, a sign, just a small remark, we do not see diversification as much. Most of the exports are concentrated on few sectors and we really like to uh, uh, work close, closely and closer with uh, LDCs to understand how we can support diversification more into value added products. Then what is the problem we are seeing now? The problem we are seeing that um, 10 or more countries that currently benefit from uh, uh, what we call everything but arms could graduate from LDCs and th th therefore will lose the duty-free quota-free access. And this unprecedented number of countries exiting the everything but arms will pose challenges, no? Challenges in terms of um, how those countries can continue their economic development and how can they continue eradication of poverty. I have some names here, but I'm sure you know them all. Angola, Bhutan, Sao Tome, Solomon Island, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar. All those countries are expected to leave the LDC status and thus lose the everything but arms. Sorry. Uh, stop. This was my timer for the four minutes, uh, but I will <laughs> close it off. So um, 
so these countries will lose then everything but arm access. And the country that seems to lose the most is Bangladesh because they are the biggest user. And in the current criteria under the GSP uh, regime, they will not benefit from the duty-free access, quota-free uh, duty-free access that offers what we call GSP plus. So if Bangladesh graduates from LDCs, they will immediately lose uh, the uh, uh, duty-free quota free access and they are not able to apply for a different equal type of regime that we call GSP plus. And that's a, that is, that is a reflection we are currently having quite extensively in EU. How can we support all this high number of countries that are exiting the LDCs to continue to, be, to benefit from, from a generous access to the EU market? How can we continue to support Bangladesh as well as in terms of impact? on GDP and economic welfare, an external study we have conducted show a relatively significant negative impact for Bangladesh on GDP and economic welfare if they are to lose the everything but arms regime. And for the African countries, we are less worried because most of the LDCs, if they are graduating, they will access the economic partnership agreement, the trade arrangements we have with African countries. So now I exhausted my time. I'm closing off now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. I mean, um, again, for your very, very candid uh, assessment of the situation, the European Union is one of our most important partners and uh, your continued support would be critical to ensure a smooth transition and sustainable graduation. Now more than ever, as we grapple with the pandemic crisis, uh, which actually stands to jeopardize many of our development gains. The fear of losing benefits, I think is foremost, sometimes you know, almost putting a break to national aspirations to graduate. And on the one hand, the political masters would like to, you know, there is a huge national asp uh, aspiration, I can say that from in my country's perspective, to graduate. But at the same time, when we hear that, you know, all benefits will go away, uh, I think that puts a break to our aspirations. Uh, so we'll have to find a way uh, to ensure that there is a smooth transition to mitigate uh, the negative impacts. And I think the European Union will be critical in, uh, in supporting us in finding that smooth uh, sort of way to go about. And uh, we, we really hope uh, that the European Union will remain closely engaged uh, with us uh, as we prepare for LDC5, because, you know, again, graduation, we, we want to put the spotlight on graduation also in LDC5, and we hope that you remain engaged with us as we prepare for LDC5 to ensure that, you know, we have a good package, good uh, reflection there in our outcome document. Thank you once again for joining us, and I hope that you can stay on. There may be questions for you. I mean, you know, we, we want to be, again, sort of assured that European Union and other development partners will be with us as we graduate. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, we have the last speaker now, and uh, we have uh, Mr. I would now like to invite Mr. Malcolm Johnson, the Deputy Secretary General of ITU, to make his presentation. Mr. Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Uh, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to express ITU support to graduating and graduated countries, especially uh, for their all important digital transformation. Digital technologies are essential for social and economic development and the achievement of the SDGs. And nowhere is this truer than in the graduating and graduated countries. The COVID uh, pandemic has unfortunately set back some of the gains made over recent years. And as we know, almost half the world's population is still offline. Most of these uh, people live in the rural and remote communities, either because of uh, difficulty in bringing them connectivity at affordable price uh, due to the terrain challenges, uh, or the fact that the return on investment is so much less uh, than in urban areas. So this makes the creation of an enabling environment uh, essential to encourage investment from the private sector to bring affordable connectivity to these regions and, and people. 
At the same time, people need to be made aware of the benefits uh, of connecting. And so the content has to be developed that's relevant to them in the local language. And the digital skills need to be developed so that people can take best advantage of the connectivity and can themselves develop relevant content and develop innovations and maybe start up businesses. So this uh, connectivity is more important than ever, and especially as we've seen during the pandemic when people rely on it for health advice to, to continue their work and studies, or just to keep in touch with friends and relatives. ITU's core activities are the world management of the radio spectrum and satellite orbits, and the development of international technical standards and the promotion of best practices. So these activities are very important to ensure interoperability of devices and services and to reduce costs through the economies of scale. ITU's support to graduating and graduated countries spans best practices for, on policies and regulations to encourage uh, the building and development of the phys physical infrastructure and networks um, but as well as developing the human and institutional capacities. So we provide uh, assistance in cybersecurity, disaster risk reduction and management, and supporting countries in areas of electronic waste and climate change. We also develop ICT applications and services for education, agriculture and health. And small island developing states, as, as is well known, have particular challenges, so ITU prioritizes them. ITU activities um, provide for uh, the support of graduated countries in the post-graduation period. So let me give you two examples. In Botswana, uh, ITU is delivering a nationally focused assistance in the collection of e-waste uh, data and statistics. And in Vanuatu, the most recently uh, graduated, ITU is delivering emergency telecommunication response activities. And both countries uh, receive support from ITU on cybersecurity. ITU will be addressing this uh, connectivity agenda at the coming ITU World Telecommunication Development Conference with the theme Connecting the Unconnected to Achieve Sustainable Development, and the output of which will feed into the LDC5. With so many different organizations now relying on digital technology for development collaboration, coordination, and cooperation are, are key words, so that we each bring our own specific competencies to the table, avoid duplication of effort, and pool our resources for the common good. So ITU is committed to forging collaborative partnerships across public and private sector, and with the UN system, and uh, we're fortunate uh, that we have a very large private sector to, to help, private sector membership to help with this. Uh, we're working with UNICEF to connect every school, UNFPA to build sustainable digital innovation ecosystems, ILO on digital accessibility, and WHO on mobile and AI for health, and with UNDP on building a digital capacity. So with less than one out of five people in connecting to the internet in the LDCs. Much work uh, clearly re remains to be done. And, and ITU looks forward to working with all partners to continue supporting the LDCs and countries at different stages of the graduation process. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much uh, for highlighting the importance of harnessing the benefits of digital technologies uh, in the graduation process. Thank you very much. Your Secretary General also joined us yesterday uh, on a, a special thematic session at the, at, the SDG, at the LDC PrepCom that we are having and shared with us, of course, the very, very important uh, role that an inclusive digital uh, policy, uh, inclusive digital uh, digitization, inclusiveness of a digital economy, digitalization in the graduation process and for the LDCs. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, distinguished um, uh, colleagues, distinguished delegates, um, friends, uh, the floor is now. We have heard some excellent presentation from a range of um, stakeholders at the national level and also at the international level. I would now like to open the floor uh, 
for comments or questions uh, 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 to the panelist and uh, you can request for the floor by raising your hand or by using the chat box so i hope Ambassador, that somebody... Ambassador, yes the yes. resident coordinator from djibouti has raised her hand okay okay yes uh, so i'd like to give the floor to the resident coordinator of djibouti and to be followed by i believe our delegate uh, the colleague from bhutan has also requested the floor thank you you have the floor RC from Djibouti. The resident co coordinator from Djibouti, you have the floor. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Afternoon. Yes. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm uh, Danon uh, at the resident coordinator office of Djibouti. And I would like to uh, ask a question about uh, uh, the availability of a higher frequency data, because uh, during the presentation, I've been mentioned at some key points during the preparation for graduation. Uh, in Djibouti, we have uh, um, actually a um, very weak national statistic system. It is very difficult to have a very um, frequent data, even for basic statistics. So, um, my question is, uh, when, when we know that it will need time to improve such a situation, what the CDP can uh, offer as an, an alternative during that preparation for graduation? I mean, uh, uh, improving a statistic system take time. Sometimes it, take, it, it may take years. So what are the alternatives? Since it is a, a key point. Over. Thank you. I thank you very much uh, for your question. I hope somebody has taken note of that. I could only gather you just, you raised the issue about the availability of high quality data. All right. Um, and next, I would like to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Nepal to be followed by Bhutan. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, good morning, all protocol observed. At the outset, I would like to thank Permanent Representative uh, of Bangladesh, CTP Secretariat, or Jarala for organizing this important event. This year, Nepal has been recommended for graduation from LDC category by CTP. Uh, Nepal's graduation is a unique case as we are the first and only country to be recommended for graduation without meeting the per capita income threshold. Uh, the onslaught of COVID-19 pandemic has taken a heavy toll and further strained the resources. While adding further vulnerability amidst a missing scenario, the optimistic outlook expressed in February may have to be revisited based on the emerging evidence and data. In this regard, we appreciate the CDP for recommending a five years preparatory period for us. Uh, while graduating is an important milestone in a country's development trajectory, it comes with um, uh, upfront costs and loss of support measures. Moreover, the fallout of COVID-19 pandemic in public health system, as well as uncertainty, uh, uh, uncertainty further added uh, our stress uh, in this regard. In this context, uh, I would like to um, pose my question to the respected um, uh, CDP member, uh, Mr. Devupuri Bhattacharya, that what are your suggestions for the countries like Nepal in implementing a smooth um, tra uh, transitioning strategy as well as a resilient recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much, uh, Nepal, for your questions. And now I'd like to give the floor to the representative of Bhutan. You have the floor. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Ambassador, for giving me the floor. Excellencies, dear colleagues, allow me to join others in appreciating the permanent mission of Bangladesh, UNOHR, LLS, and CDP for convening this important event on the sidelines of the first session of the LDC-5 Preparatory Committee. As we engage in discussions on articulating priorities in the lead up to Doha conference, the issue of graduation, among others, deserves a renewed focus and transformative narrative. As emphasized by earlier speakers, we are at a critical juncture 
amidst very challenging global circumstances wherein the LDC-5 needs to build on successes achieved on reaching graduation thresholds and to provide further impetus towards realizing SDGs in the LDCs. I thank the speakers for the insightful presentations and informative updates, particularly the initiatives taken by CDP on sustainable gradu graduation support facility and by the interagency task force led by OHR LLS and the sharing of country experiences. The nature and scope of this morning's discussions resonate very well with the thinking of my uh, thinking and concerns of my country. Bhutan is set to graduate from the LDC category by 2023 and currently is among 16 other LDCs who are at varying stages of graduation. However, for Bhutan and other LDCs on the graduation track, the transition is taking place during an unprecedented time in human history. It takes place at a most difficult time when the world is faced with crisis like no other. As such, this has only added urgency of the need for ensuring graduate, graduating countries like Bhutan remain on a sustainable development path backed by appropriate and meaningful support mechanisms that address the specific needs of the graduating country. Director Hiddy's reflection on how graduating LDCs should sustain progress being a fragile portion is most relevant. In this regard, Bhutan supports Ambassador Fatima's remark on the need for a bold and innovative solution to achieve incentive-based graduation as we see incentivizing graduation being the key. Otherwise, all our callings, including the overarching principle of leaving no one behind, shall always remain elusive. For too long, we have had far too many resolutions, both in the General Assembly and ECOSOC, recognizing the vulnerabilities of graduating LDCs and calling for strengthened smooth transition support measures without tangible outcomes that are responsive to the needs of graduating, graduating and recently graduated LDCs. Bhutan is in the process of elaborating our transition strategy. We are hopeful that our engagement today will help augment our collective effort and amplify our voices towards a concrete policy outcome in the form of a well-coordinated UN system support to LDC graduation and integration of smooth transition strategies into the eight strategies of our development partners. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Bhutan. And I have two more further requests. And I believe I'll have to close the list there uh, unless there are other requests because you know, we we'll like to sort of have some uh, closing remarks. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Lao PDR followed by the representative of Bangladesh RCO. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the I would, opportunity. I would request you also to be very brief in your intervention, yeah, so that we get a chance for the uh, panelists to respond to some of the issues that you have raised. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. I just wish to take the floor to express my um, delegation support to your uh, opening statement, the needs for the graduating and graduated uh, uh, countries to be um, supported in during this uh, difficult uh, time. And I also want, would like to um, express our appreciation to the uh, presentation by Madame Hedy Fox and the distinguished member of the uh, CDP. I have one uh, particular question on concerning the enhanced uh, support measures and, and monitoring. Uh, the distinguished member of CDP mentioned about the limited incentive for the member state to provide or to report on or monitor the progress and submit it to the um, uh, UN or the uh, ECOSOC. But the, the support measures have not been followed through um, to implement those recommendations. And, and how can we um, increase uh, the number of countries to monitor and to submit their reports? And how can we ensure that actions or support measures be uh, accorded um, to the, the countries in need, um, particularly in this um, pandemic? Thank you. 
I thank I thank the distinguished representative of Law PDR also for raising a very pertinent uh, issues. I now I give the floor um, to the representative of the RCO Bangladesh. You have the floor. We can't hear you. You are muted. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good morning, evening, afternoon. Uh, this is Madhubin Islam. I'm working for Bangladesh RCO as economics. Thank you for giving me the floor, ma'am, uh, Ambassador. Uh, very quickly, uh, after establishment, this is a question. After establishment of WTO in 1995, five countries have graduated. If you count Botswana, who graduated in 1994, there are six countries, and now three countries are graduating, and also seven are in the pipeline. But I think uh, we feel that there's a lack of available lessons and information on the experiences of these countries who, are, who have already graduated. So it's a question that is there in study on what has changed in these countries in terms of trade, intellectual property rights, or what is the condition on productive capacity in terms of HDI or other social economic indicators? Where are these countries lacking and why? What support measures were provided? Uh, but we're not sufficient probably. Uh, so we SGSF conduct some studies on this, uh, comprehensive on the graduate countries on the graduate students and others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Majid. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, we don't have much time, but you know, but some important issues have been raised from the floor. So I would now like to turn back the floor to the um, panelists and presenters, if any would like to take the floor. Perhaps I can start with uh, our two distinguished uh, members from CDP, uh, Dr. Devupriya Bhattacharya and Mr. Tesvachu. Uh, if any one of you would like to respond to some of the questions raised very, very briefly. Yes, um, Madam Chair, may I come in? Yes, please. Say. Yes, yes, yeah. please. Uh, sir. Uh, one issue regarding the, the the issue regarding the incentive for the for for the graduating countries in order to engage with the monitoring process. Uh, my general point is that if you look at the history, then the uh, the demand side on the part of the graduated LDCs or graduating LDCs have been pretty weak because of a number of reasons. First, there was a no process for the graduated LDCs to engage adequately. Number two, there was not adequate data on that. And number three, there were not mechanisms which are related to specifically to the responses. So all these things need to be corrected under the enhanced mechanism over there. One will have to see one of the major points would be the commitment, the revealed commitment on the part of the graduating LDCs towards graduation, smooth graduation. So generation of a uh, smooth graduation strategy will be important and continuous gap analysis that how the country is deviating or not deviating from that particular uh, trajectory, the planned trajectory will be important. For that high frequency data will be constantly necessary. And along with that is important to mobilize the country level the development partners, because the actual resources are with lying with the development partners in the country. And there may be an umbrella uh, arrangement globally, but the, it is important that the country level we do those things over there. So I, I see there is a great uh, you know, responsibility for the graduating countries to take advantage of it. So we will have to have you know, the more transparency and accountability process done based on more information and pre pre assessing on that. I just wanted to, Madam, take one minute to, uh, to bring uh, to, uh, the kind attention of the colleague from European Union about the GSP. I don't know, Madam Alina is gone or not. The issue is that, you know, the, uh, the GSP plus is undergoing a review at this moment at the European Council and also then will come soon to the European Parliament. The issue is that it is important that the current inclusive dialogue which is going on, that the, the interest of the graduated LDCs are adequately reflected in that debate. Bangladesh is doing its part, but I think it is important to have a collective voice in, 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 a, in, in, in a Brussels for the graduating LDCs to get into that. My, the, for history, the only graduated LDC who gets the GSP+, plus, which gives not zero tariff, which gives 66% tariff rebate. So is the Cabo Verde, 
Cabo Verde could negotiate a number of derogations from the requirements on the threshold conditions and the market share condition and the eligibility criteria on sustainable development. I think it is time that the graduating LDCs as a group work it out and see what kind of derogation they will be needing in order to get into the GSP plus and also to enhance the current three years transition given to the all EBA countries after graduation. Now it is three years. It has to be made at least five years, if not more. That negotiation has to be done as well to increase the transition time to the after graduation from three to five years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, your uh, for your reflections and uh, for responding to the, some very specific issues that came from the floor. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you wanted to respond? Yes. Very you. briefly. I would request everybody responding to be very, 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 very brief. Huh? Okay. All right. Yes, I'm always brief. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You no, it was just to respond to the question about uh, statistics which uh, are very important, of course, for adjusting and developing policies. So I'd just like to bring um, the attention to the Partnership on Measuring ICTs for Development, which is an international multi-stakeholder partnership with, with ITU to approve, um, to make available uh, quality ICT data and indicators, especially for developing countries. So this can be found um, on the web. Um, there's a lot of information there on, on the methodologies, best method methodologies to be used. So definitely recommend uh, looking at that uh, to develop good statistics, which are so important for policy making and for training. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you again also to ITU for all your support. Uh, does any other panelist or expert wish to take the floor very briefly? Can I, can yes, I say just yes, a quick Mr. word? Yes, to, please, to, please. To, to just quickly, since we don't have time, to complement what Mr. Johnson was saying and also to respond to uh, the question from Djibouti. Uh, I believe his specific question is that uh, high quality data uh, is, is not um, available or data and statistics is difficult in, in Djibouti and how can we be helped through the support mechanism for countries uh, that are graduating now um, very soon I'm sure Djibouti will be one of those countries meeting all the criteria for graduation in that situation as we introduced today the um, graduation support uh, uh, facility actually is uh, uh, to do exactly that. And I can foresee, for example, as part of the capacity uh, building uh, part of the services provided by the facility, Djibouti receiving assistance in terms of improving its data collection, data analysis and collection process, and including, for example, with participation of ITU, because the whole idea of the uh, graduation support facility um, is working with the interagency uh, task force is to mobilize different institutions that has the capacity to help these graduating countries uh, to, to, to um, deal with such specific concerns they have like data. So I can reassure him that this is the purpose of this facility being proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tesfachu. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm afraid we're running out of time and I, uh, our apologies to everyone present here for going over time. But if you'll permit, can we just go for maybe another five, seven minutes to wrap up, if that is all right with everyone? Thank you. Would any other panelist or speaker briefly like to respond, very, very briefly like to respond to some of the questions raised? No? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, perhaps now before I wrap up and uh, share some takeaways, uh, uh, would the co-conveners DESA or OHRLLS, that is Mr. Roland Morales or Heidi Fox would like to uh, briefly, briefly give some concluding remarks. I would uh, perhaps ask Roland to go first, Mr. Laura, Roland Morales. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And thank you so much to all the speakers and, and to the interesting uh, questions. I think everything has been said, just to give my two cents to all this. Um, we got a very interesting historical perspective in a way with uh, the, the, the government official from Vanuatu starting with uh, the journey in 1980. 
1994 was mentioned and then the Maldives also um, came in uh, with, with its experience. And I think uh, by listening to the speakers, what I noted down is the, the interesting shifts that have been taking place um, uh, in, in the context of graduation throughout the, the history of it. And one is that I think it started with a lot of concern and apprehension and it is changing now into what Vanuatu referred to as a celebration. And I think that's, that's very positive. Um, there have been shifts in also in, in uh, preparing and helping the countries in, um, in the process of support to graduation. And the, the presentations by um, the esteemed CDP members focused on, on continuation of, of work on that um, through um, the enhanced monitoring mechanism and the graduation support facility. I think another very positive um, um, element has also been a shift in, in the number of LDCs starting from a, a very slow trickle of, of graduating countries to now having 16 of them in the pipeline. And uh, while listening to, to you all, um, it was all about, or a lot was said about um, the tasks and, and how to achieve smooth transition and what countries uh, could be doing. And in my mind, I think the other side of the coin is also um, what can the development partners and should the development partners do? And again, there has been a shift. And, and to me, uh, and uh, for some who have listened to me in, in the recent past, to me, the IATF on graduation, that task force is of, of critical importance. And, and it is a very um, a positive element to address um, that fear of losing benefits, uh, the lack of clarity, um, how to achieve true celebration, how to uh, achieve graduation with, uh, with momentum, and very much agree there with um, the, the representative of the EU, um, how to also work on, on diversification. And only if the, the development partners succeed in doing that, um, I think we can have a successful graduation and it is happening. Um, we, we, under the leadership of OHROS, um, we, we are now working closely with the RCOs, UNDP, regional commissions, Geneva-based and, and elsewhere organizations such as the WTO, um, ITC, EIF, ITU, UNIDO, et cetera, et cetera, as well as bilateral partners. And I think if the IATF could continue like that, um, hopefully um, in, in the, the recent uh, um, future, it can also be granted a graduation certificate of, of acting as one. And, and, and I think only if that happens, if we succeed with that, we can really achieve a sustainable graduation for the countries. And with that, um, Ambassador, um, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. And I take this opportunity to support CDP for the excellent support that you have been giving to us. Uh, Hedi, do you have anything to say or you want to forego? Uh, thank you very much. To speak? Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Just two words uh, to, uh, first of all, thank you for so ably uh, uh, guiding us through this very interesting discussion. And I could not uh, uh, echo more what Roland has just said that the need for coordinated support on graduation is is absolutely there. The um, the the uh, I think the, the it was the minister from the Maldives had said that everybody must eventually graduate, and that is what we are working uh, towards. Financing is crucial, uh, in particular the terms of financing as countries are. Uh, continuing to um, graduate and the um, interagency task force um, is a real uh, show of how the UN has come together and how we can um, uh, work better together uh, in collaboration at uh, uh, global, regional and, and, and country level and this graduation support facility can be one of the major outcomes of Doha conference and this opportunity should not be missed. So um, I just, I think that's a good place uh, for us, uh, for me to stop, but also to say what was emphasized also by uh, the delegate from Bhutan that the continued vulnerabilities of graduating LDCs must be considered and we, the, the support that is, is given to the countries as they graduate must be long-term. Thank you very much, Ambassador.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Hedi. Uh, excellencies, dear colleagues, distinguished panelists. Uh, I think we have had, had an excellent um, discussion today. It went much beyond our expectation. And I, I wish to thank uh, all our distinguished panelists uh, and uh, uh, participants for being here with us and for their very important contribution to this very important uh, discussion. Uh, I have a few takeaways. And if, uh, if you'll kindly allow me, I'll uh, take perhaps two more minutes to go over a few takeaways from the discussion that we have had. First, I think we all agree that the graduating and graduated countries are facing tremendous challenges to implement 2030 agenda due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is highly important to ensure new and improved support measures, especially in trade, IPR and financing. We have heard from the representatives or a representative of EU how much the graduating LDCs are dependent on the EBA benefits. It is therefore important that the EU considers the extension of EBA benefits to graduated countries in a time-bound and country-specific manner beyond graduation. Uh, I appreciate that the IATF is working hard towards the end to come up with some concrete ideas for support. Uh, sustainable graduation support facility, adequate finance and capacity building will be the key for the success of the FGSF. Secondly, there is a lack of clarity on graduation support. The graduating and graduated countries are not aware sometimes of the full implication of the loss of ISMs in many cases. The new SGSF should aim to have comprehensive support for graduating and graduated countries to mitigate the impacts of such loss, especially through policy guidance, capacity building, and access to real-time information data. We have heard that uh, over and over again during the of the discussion. Third, and I think this was a very important point that was made by earlier speakers, there's no one size fit alone solution, uh, fit all solution. Every country's situation is different. The support should therefore be demand driven and country specific. It is also important to have a multi-stakeholder approach to ensure smooth transition. There should be tailored support to address every aspect of graduation, namely loss of ISMs, access to non-LDC specific support, smooth transition, FFD, South-South cooperation and partnership and so on. Fourthly, graduation monitoring and surveillance are highly important to ensure that there are adequate and timely support measures to avoid any slide back. So far, CDP's monitoring has been more focused on pre-graduation phase than on post-graduation phase. But as the number of graduating and graduated countries are increasing, the demand have grown on both supply and demand sites. It is important to refocus on monitoring and smooth uh, graduation. And that include the process outcome and incentives of better reporting as uh, very clearly reminded to us by Dr. Bhattacharya, both by the incumbent country and the CDP uh, or the UN system. Fifth, enhanced monitoring mechanism must entail timely response from the UN and other development partners. DCF and UN country teams should have better coordination. Capacity development of both the UN and the graduating countries must be given sharper focus, along with capacity development gaps, data gaps, policy support gaps, coordination gaps must also be mitigated. Finally, excellencies, the political willingness both at national and global levels to put LDC graduation high on our agenda will be the key to move forward the important issues that have come up today. We have, uh, we are having different thematic discussions uh, right now uh, in the first PREPCOM meeting that we are having this week. Graduation has come as an overarching theme in all these discussions and we intend to have very focused discussion on graduation on the 28th morning that is on Friday morning uh, yes Friday morning and uh, I look forward to carrying uh, some of these takeaways to that meeting and to advancing some of the discussions that we've had here today to the PREPCOM as well as uh, as we prepare for Doha in the other meetings in the intervening period. I would rest it here. Again, our apologies for going over time, but I, uh, I hope you'll all agree that it was a very, very rich and fruitful discussion. And I hope that we can continue discussing and engaging as we lead up to Doha and to have an ambitious uh, and realistic um, sort of ambitious and uh, a transformative agenda for the LDCs as well as for the graduating and graduated countries. Once again, my deep appreciation to all of you for joining us today and for your very important contribution. I thank you all. Have a good thank day. You. Thank, thank you, you, Ambassador.
Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Roland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Excellency, Thank you so for the Bye -bye. very good summary. Thank you. Excellent Thank you, sir. Summary. Thank you. It's all your points that have come up from there. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, Heidi. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Margaret. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Zima. Thank you, Roland. Thank Margarita, you. thank you very much. And thank you to all the interpreters. Thank you, Bob, for your support. Yes, you, you have managed it extremely well. Thank you. Oh, thank and enjoyed you, the, You're always and, so sweet. <laughs> and greatly enjoyed the half an hour over time. Well, you know, it's not a formal meeting. It's our Zoom. <laughs> No, no, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> it was all worthwhile. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. So I will uh, then share the, um, the recording.